Hi, this is Professor Cahan, and this is History 1301, U.S. History 2, 1877, and this is Lecture 5, uh, Massachusetts, the Pilgrims, and the Puritans. This is going to be Part 2 in our section about uh, English colonization in the New World. So I want to take a second here to kind of recap where we've been in the last couple of classes. During the 1600s, England was, uh, or heading into the 1800s, England was backward and underdeveloped, but they were desperate to change this circumstance. They wanted to put the poor to work so that they could enrich the state. That's what mercantilism was all about. And that's why they adopt a system that winds up exploiting these uh, these people, but does not raise them out of poverty. Nobody is thinking in those terms in England. Those poor uh, who were not in workhouses frequently ended up in Virginia as indentured servants. So there's a problem in the new world as well with that working class, because those indentured servants and the freedmen who followed when those indentured servants became freedmen, they were constantly on the verge of rebelling against the ruling class in Virginia, and that winds up happening with Bacon's Rebellion in 1675. So Virginia turns to slavery in large part because of the elite's fear throughout all of this. They felt that slavery would somehow be safer. It's safer because slaves don't have a view of, ex uh, or they don't have an expectation of rising up in society. They don't have an expectation for freedom for either themselves or their children. So Virginia sets their laboring class apart, unlike in England where they, remember, separated them by putting a blue P on the left shoulder. In Virginia, they separate this laboring class via skin color. So there's no need for something like that. In theory, you can instantly tell who the laboring class is simply by looking at them. But there is a problem from the perspective of the enslaved people themselves. What is their incentive to actually work? Indentured servants will work because they know that as long as they finish their term of indenture, they will be freed. So they've got an incentive to work. The enslaved don't really have an incentive to work. But very early, Virginians realize that the coercion, if you will, is physical pain. So Virginia's colonial assembly passed laws that reflected this. They stated that a slave owner could beat they could whip, they could even kill an enslaved person in the course of discipline, and it was perfectly legal. Uh, all people had to do was demonstrate that it was in the course of corrective behavior. Uh, now, everybody in Virginia has to be invested in this system. This is how the system of slavery and liberty and freedom arise together. In, the, in a previous class, I told you, slavery and liberty rise together. Here is how this works. In Virginia, as soon as these elites adopt slavery, they realize that they're going to have to do something to end the process of indentured servitude. They have to do something to set all whites apart from their laboring class of slaves who are coming out of Africa. So what these people did was they started seizing all land that was actually owned by peoples from Africa. Being indentured servants meant that there were going to be some black freedmen in Virginia. So the colony seized all of these people's lands. They distributed it uh, throughout Virginia by virtue of, uh, of land sales and land lotteries and the, lights, the like. They passed laws that made it legal only for white people to actually own land. And by doing this, they set a certain group of people apart from yet another group of people. And this turns out to be, from a political perspective, it turns out to be very effective because what it does, regardless of poverty, regardless of the actual everyday living conditions of these people, it sets all whites above all blacks, no matter how these people live. It made all whites equal on some level. Land ownership, or at least access to land ownership, became the great social leveler. The ability to own property becomes the definition of freedom or the definition of liberty. So for a person to have liberty, 
in these colonies meant that that person had the ability to own property. If a person doesn't have the ability to own property, by default, they are a slave in this sort of philosophical equation that they're creating. As a result, this connection between slavery and liberty made Virginians among the most committed people in the American colonies to the ideas of, quote, liberty and freedom. Now, it did not matter to Virginians that if we looked at this as a whole, if we looked at the entire population, that approximately 40% of white people in Virginia were as poor and exploited as those African slaves that replaced them as the basic labor class. Virginians didn't care. They understood that they were people at white Virginians understood that they were people at liberty. They could possibly own property, and there is no way they will actually be, quote-unquote, below any of those people of African descent. And to underscore this connection between uh, liberty and slavery and all of this stuff, when the Revolutionary War ended, Virginia did quite a few things. They uh, not only had distributed land to e to level all Af uh, all whites, uh, they also granted all veterans of the Revolutionary War, the, the now state of Virginia, granted all veterans of the Revolutionary War 300 acres and a slave. So these people were not only rising up just out of the quote-unquote freedmen class, they're rising up a couple of steps. They're coming up to, remember, that, that slaveholding class. They've jumped two spots. There's slaves at the bottom. There's the freedmen at the next level. There's yeoman farmers, people who own land but don't own slaves. The next step up is land uh, slaveholders. These are people who own land and own somewhere between 1 and 19 slaves. And at the very top, you've got the planter class, the people who own 20 or more slaves. So these, uh, these Virginia veterans from the Revolutionary War have the ability to jump just like that, rise up incredibly high in uh, in terms of the class structure in Virginia. So it's a critical moment when they make this decision to switch over from indentured servitude to use slavery. Now, up to this point, I have not mentioned religion hardly at all in this class, but religion is going to be a key factor in our next topic and the founding of the next two colonies we talk about, because the people who found these two colonies, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay, are going to be doing so primarily out of religious motivations. And this is a good place to start uh, pointing out who these people were and what they actually believed. These are two very distinctly different groups of people who settle in Massachusetts. Uh, and the reason I'm making the point of these are two very different and distinct groups of people is that a lot of history textbooks and a lot of historians, in fact, uh, talk about the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Pilgrims of the Plymouth Colony as being interchangeable. They talk about them as synonymous groups of people. But to be clear on this, they are not the same groups of people. There are two distinctly different groups. The Pilgrims who settled in the Plymouth Colony were separatists from the Church of England. Now, you guys have probably all heard their story because if you know the so-called Thanksgiving narrative of this country, then you know who the, the pilgrims are. They were fleeing religious persecution. Specifically, they believed that the Church of England was so beyond redemption that they had to leave that church, that it could not be fixed. So first, they fled to the Netherlands. And then when they got to the Netherlands, they believed that things are good here, but our children are starting to adopt Dutch cultural norms, and we don't want that either. So they decided we want to leave the Church of England, but we want to maintain who we are culturally. So our only option is to go to the Americas, to found a colony in the Americas so that we can maintain who we are as English people, but separate from the Church of England. Okay. Uh, it's also important to note here uh, that when they get to the Americas, uh, they're following that guide po that guidebook that I talked about that John Smith had written uh, that said, 
the area in this in Massachusetts was so well planted and inhabited that he'd rather live there than anywhere else. I think I referenced this uh, in lecture one, Close Encounters. So that's who the pilgrims are. The Puritans are a totally different group here. The Puritans did not believe, nor did they want, separation. They believed that separation from the Church of England would be sinful. Now, the Puritans did agree with the pilgrims in that they believed that the Church of England had become corrupt. So that's they're on the same road at that point. But where they diverge is in the area or in the arena of separation. The pilgrims said we should separate and go off our own way. And what the Puritans did, as their name would imply, the Puritans believed that it was their special mission to purify the Church of England or to fix the Church of England. And they had a very specific idea about how to fix that Church of England. They were going to establish a colony in the New World. They wound up going to Massachusetts Bay uh, in present-day Cape Cod, Massachusetts, to do this. And their plan in Massachusetts was to establish, as they put it, a, quote, city on a hill, an example for the rest of the world to follow. Their leaders, guys like Jonathan Winthrop, believed that what would happen is the Puritans would go to New England, they would create this model community, and then everybody in the Church of England would look at this and say, that's the way it's supposed to be, so we've got to do what they are doing. Now, for the remainder of this particular lecture, the group that we're going to be focusing on most of the time, I would suggest 95% of our efforts, are going to be in looking at the Puritans. And the reason for this is that the Puritans are far more important to American history than virtually any other uh, original religious group in the Americas. Uh, they're far more important than the Pilgrims. While the Pilgrims established that Thanksgiving story, uh, within a generation, the Puritans wind up overrunning and controlling that Pilgrim colony, which is why I think a lot of historians look at these two groups and go, oh, they're interchangeable, because one wound up overrunning and taking over the other's area. Now, the Puritans are a group of religious radicals. And there's been lots of groups uh, throughout history who have been motivated by religion. Uh, and the Puritans bore a very strong similarity uh, to these other types of groups. The Puritans, as they saw it, wanted to create a, a new society, quote, from the root and branch, as they put it. The Puritans are the first revolutionaries in the New World. They're the first revolutionaries in North America. And they had sort of a model to follow. They, looked, they could look to the very recent past and see, there's an example of what can happen if you are a religious revolutionary and you're motivated and you try to change society. But in addition to it being an example, a model for them, it was also a sort of cautionary tale. And that cautionary tale uh, was the case of a Catholic priest named Savonarola who lived in uh, Florence, Italy, during the 15th century, right just before all of this uh, happened uh, with the Puritans. Now, Savonarola was a deeply religious Catholic priest who was convinced that the society around Florence, Italy, was entirely too sinful, that they had become obsessed with sin, they had become obsessed with vice, and it was his job to fix this. He was there to, quote, purify, just like the Puritans saw it as their job to purify the Church of England. Now, Savonarola attracted an enormous following uh, to his teachings and to his ideas about what to do in Florentine society, and he got all of these followers to agree to abandon sin, to destroy evil, and a big part of how they did this was a symbolic gesture called the Bonfire of the Vanities, in which he got people to come to this bonfire and take their luxury items to take their uh, to take secular items like books that had nothing to do with religion uh, or to take uh, fancy clothing or things like that and throw them onto this bonfire. Now, obviously, there's a reason why I'm calling it symbolic. A person who takes this incredibly expensive clothing and throws it on the bonfire, that doesn't mean they're done with that sort of stuff. It means they don't 
have those particular clothes anymore. But it doesn't mean that they threw necessarily all of those uh, lux luxury goods on the fire. And it doesn't mean that they couldn't just go out and buy more of them. That's why I say it's a symbolic thing. By doing something like this, they're signifying their willingness to throw off all of this vice. Um, now why I say this as a, a this was a cautionary tale is because people aspire, people like Savonarola and like the Puritans, they aspire to these great heights and they get people to follow along and they achieve all of this sort of stuff. But the caution here is in what comes after you've achieved this goal. These Florentine peoples got rid of all of this stuff and they start living this sort of more moral life that Savonarola has been talking about. But the people in Florence, to put it bluntly, got bored with life. They said, this moral life is not all it was cracked up to be. We kind of liked the old sinful life. So in the end, the people of Florence decided that this was not for them and that Savonarola was not for them. And ultimately, they had another bonfire and they burned Savonarola at the stake. So the Puritans have this cautionary tale right in their own, uh, in their background, in the very recent past, to say, look, here's what could happen if we go a little bit too far with all of this. Now, today, there's not a single Puritan left in the world. The, uh, we use Puritan today primarily as an adjective. Uh, for example, I'm a baseball fan. I think that's pretty obvious because I keep using the baseball as a prop. Uh, in this class. I'm a baseball fan, and I don't like the designated hitter. So people say, I'm a, I am puritanical about the designated hitter. So there are Puritans from an adjectival standpoint, but not in terms of this specific sect of people within the Anglican Church. The Puritan Church no longer exists. But we still have plenty of people in this country, virtually everyone, whether uh, they are male, female, non-binary, whether they are uh, whether they are white, black, Latino, uh, Asian, uh, whatever ethnic group, whatever their uh, whatever their color, whatever their cultural perspective, whatever their class position in society, every single person in the United States bears some legacy from the Puritans within our society because Puritans shape American ideals and attitudes toward sex, toward arts and government. Indeed, they shape our ideas about our role in the world. For example, the Puritans believed that their city, as I told you a few minutes ago, they believed that their city or their society was a, quote, city on a hill, a model for the rest of the world to emulate. They believed that they were sent to the new world by God on a mission they were there to purify the Church of England, to show everybody else how it's done. And they're supposed to spread their values to the rest of the world. They believed that they were God's chosen people and that they possessed the one true creed. Now, we have plenty of people who say stuff like that in the modern world. But remember, I told you that these people shaped our ideas about our role in the world, the United States' role in the world, our politics, all of this other stuff. Where we see this ideal and this attitude in the modern world in the United States is we have lots of commentators. We have lots of politicians who talk about what the United States should do. We talk about what the American sense of mission is when we go abroad, if we go into another country. What our goals there are are things like bringing American ideals to those areas, or we bring American-style democracy there, or we put an American idea about the marketplace in these areas. You have a lot of commentators who talk about this is the best way to do this stuff. The American way is the best way. So understand that the roots are actually in this Puritan idea about a city on a hill. That's what this is all about. Puritans also had particularly uh, had particular ideas about sex. Now, one thing that we need to dispose of uh, in terms of myth with the Puritans is that the Puritans were opposed, quote unquote, to sex. Now, they had children. They got married. Obviously, people are engaging as Puritans. So the Puritans are not opposed to it. 
but they are not opposed to it in very specific circumstances. They're all in favor of what two people can do within the bounds of marriage. It's outside of marriage that they are terrified of what could happen with sex. They are deathly afraid of, or they were deathly afraid of sex outside of marriage. Now, one way we can see this in society, in Puritan society without having to read things like the Scarlet Letter uh, is, uh, for example, the use of what they called tithing officers. Uh, tithing officers existed uh, specifically to collect tithes, the money that people are supposed to pay to the church. For every 10 people in a Puritan society, they had what was called a tithing officer who was going around and not only collecting the tithes, but this tithing officer's looser job description was to ensure that all were obeying the rule, the laws of God. Now, again, we don't have a perfect parallel to this in the modern world, in the modern United States. We don't exactly have tithing officers. We don't have people whose job, quote unquote, it is to go around and make sure that we're all, quote, obeying God's laws. But we certainly have plenty of people who are self-appointed tithing officers, people who go around and say, it's acceptable for these people to marry, but not these people. This is moral behavior. This is immoral behavior. And why do we say this is okay, but this isn't okay? This is moral, but this isn't. Why do we say that? Because we, this group, said so. That's it. Okay, So the Puritan ideals and the Puritan idealism continues to flow through American society. We have, uh, again, influences from the Puritans about art. They were very uneasy about artwork. At one point uh, in the mid-1600s, when the Puritans actually controlled the English government, they did things cl like closing all of the theaters throughout England, uh, as they put it, because they kept people from godly pursuits. Uh, so they had a real problem with the arts. They disliked any sort of painting styles that were not portrait paintings. They disliked uh, uh, they disliked uh, figure painting. They disliked sculpture to an incredible uh, to an incredible amount. They thought that painting a portrait of a family or painting a landscape was one thing, but to do anything else was something that might quote excite the senses. If you excite the senses, it will be bad. So they are not in favor of that. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, with other arts like uh, like ballet or theater or things like that, they thought that that just kept people from godly pursuits. If you're going to a Shakespeare play, uh, then you're not uh, spending time communing with God and thinking about what your role in this world actually is. So they have some very similar ideas that people have today about the arts. And again, we don't have a group of people who, uh, as a religious sentiment, are saying, we're going to stop this. But uh, but we actually do have plenty of people who say, we've got to take the National Endowment for the Humanities out. We've got, this is art, and this is not art. We've got plenty of people who are still absolutely uh, terrified uh, and uneasy about art in the United States in the modern era. Now, some things to know about the Pilgrims uh, and the Puritans. We'll talk about the Pilgrims first. The Pilgrims arrived right around uh, 16, or excuse me, in 1620 uh, aboard a ship called the Mayflower. Now, their original idea for their society was laid out, how they were going to do everything, was laid out in a document that all of the people signed, all of the males, excuse me, signed while they were on, they were en route to North America called the Mayflower Compact. And what this basic idea of the Mayflower Compact was, was to recreate a society, the society they wanted, but to recreate a society that was as close to the early Christian societies of the first century as possible. So for example, enshrined in the Mayflower Compact, if somebody wanted to be uh, uh, wanted to live in this area and wield any political power, they had to be a church member. So understand with the pilgrims, there's no such thing as separation between church and state. In fact, there's a distinct intertwining between church and state as far as the pilgrims see it. They also are actually tolerant on some level. They do not say that if you want to live in a 
in our setting, in our colony, they don't say you have to be a member of our church. They tolerate outsiders. But they also say to those outsiders, if you live here, you have to obey our laws. Okay, So you may not be a pilgrim. You don't have to be a pilgrim, but you will have to follow their laws, they tell people. Um, now, it's not a mystery why they come up with this type of philosophy, and this type of structure for their government. Remember, they are fleeing perceived persecution. They believe that they are being persecuted at an incredible rate in England, and they believe they have lost control. They have no control over their social groups. So it should not surprise you at all that they're going to create a society that guarantees that they will be in charge. The structure of it guarantees that they themselves will be in charge. But I also mentioned to you a few minutes ago that the pilgrims themselves are not critical to the foundations and the formation of the United States. And that's because by the 1640s, the Puritans had overrun all of the pilgrim settlements. The Puritans were going to be the ones who were in charge in Massachusetts. So within one generation, the pilgrims, they're gone. Now, as far as who the Puritans actually were, the Puritans were a group that originated uh, in the 1550s within the Church of England. But much like when I was making the, uh, the comparison about my, uh, my baseball purity, these people were described by the adjective. Puritan was strictly an adjective. It, it described people who were very, uh, very obviously moral zealots within the Church of England. And by the way, it also was not a flattering description of these people. Nobody said, oh, there's a Puritan. Aren't they cool? People looked at, it, went at them and sneered at them as they went by. So it was not a positive thing to be called a Puritan during this era. But by the 1600s, by the time the 17th, 17th century rolls around, the Puritans had coalesced, those moral zealots within the Church of England had coalesced into a very specific sect uh, within the Church of England. Those moral fanatics were a specific sect precisely because they had a series of distinctive beliefs. And we can see this in a very, uh, we can see the change here in a literary way with, uh, during this period. In the literature of the era, the Puritans cease to be described with a lowercase p, and they start being described with a capital P. So there's obviously a very distinctive difference from the Puritans of the 16th century to the Puritans of the 17th century. Now, I'm sure, given that I said that the thing that marks them uh, as a distinct sect, sect here within the Church of England is their distinctive beliefs. So you're all, I'm sure, dying to know what are those actual beliefs. So the beliefs are actually pretty simple. The first belief that the Puritans have is the idea of predestination. Predestination, the idea that even before anyone was ever born, God had created the heavens and the earth. And when he did this, when God created all of this stuff, he also, in that moment, decided precisely who is going to heaven and who is going to hell. And there's a clear line here. Those who are going to heaven are called the elect. Those who are saved are called the elect. And those who are going to hell are the damned. And the basis of predestination, the big thing about predestination is since God has already made this decision, God has made the decision and God is infallible. Therefore, it cannot be changed. The decision cannot be altered. No matter what you do here on earth, how you live, how pious you are, how often you go to church, what type of, you know, what type of life you live, it doesn't matter. God has already decided who is going to heaven and who is going to hell. There's nothing you can do as an individual to change your status. The second key distinctive belief uh, or key distinction of the Puritans is a rejection of ritual, of ceremony, and of church hierarchy. And the reason they rejected these things, particularly religion, uh, 
and ceremony, they believed that these things kept people from godly pursuits. They distracted people. Okay, so rituals and ceremonies were no good. They didn't believe, uh, for example, in celebrating birthdays. They didn't celebrate. They under, they knew what Easter and Christmas were. They understood how they fit in with Christianity, but they didn't celebrate these things because they believed that celebration of these took people's focus away from God. And think about it, uh, especially in the modern world. And uh, I'm going to be speaking about most people. So if you're watching this and you go, well, that's not me. Okay, that's fine. But not everybody fits into these narrow definitions. But think about what people focus on during, Chris, uh, during Christmas in, you know, in 2019 and 2020, what we focus on during the Christmas season. We focus not so much on the religious implications of, Chris, of Christmas, but we focus more on the consumption and the consumer activities about it. Who's getting what? And, oh, my God, what am I going to get for this person? And is it going to mean enough to them? And that sort of thing. So by focusing on that sort of stuff, and it's the same thing is happening in the 17th century, people are looking at that sort of stuff and saying, focusing on the decoration, focusing on the celebration, focusing on the gifts you're giving, that sort of thing takes your eyes, takes your soul off of what you should be doing with relation to God. So they don't like any of that sort of stuff. They also have a real problem with hierarchy in this regard. They believed that hierarchy got in the way of the relationship that God and man could actually have. And if you want to think of it, think of it in these terms. The Catholic Church has God at the very top of the hierarchy, and then just directly below God is the Pope. The Pope is considered to be God's representative on earth. God essentially rules, quote unquote, through the Pope. So the Pope gets his directives from God, and then the Pope dictates that sort of stuff downward to the cardinals, and then the cardinals dictate the stuff down to the bishops, the bishops dictate it down to the parishes, and then the priests at the parish level dictate it down to the people. But what's what all of that hierarchy is, as far as Puritans are concerned, all of that is stuff that is just in the way. As Puritans see it, it would be better to push all of that stuff out of the way and have God and man. That's it. Now, their beef with the Anglican Church was this. The Anglican Church had a similar hierarchy, except instead of the Pope, the Anglican Church had as the head of the church the king. Okay, So it was God, king, bishops, or archbishops, then bishops, then the individual parish priests, and then the individuals within the church. So there's still this big hierarchy, and they look at this and say, all of this stuff, the kings, the archbishops, the bishops, they are all in the way. So we get rid of that because it keeps man from actually getting in touch with God. So they really don't like hierarchy at all either. Another mark of the Puritans is this distinctly, rigidly divided world. They have a very black and white way of looking at things. Things are either A or they are B. There is the secular world and the religious world. There is what people do during the week, the week, and there's a difference in what they do on the weekends. Obviously, their big social distinction, there's the elect and the damned. There is the humorous and the serious. There's the world of men and there's the world of women. And that's it. It's black and white. It's one or the other. There's nothing in between. So they believe in this very rigidly divided world. Now, to say that this is revolutionary uh, sounds kind of abstract, uh, but we're going to bring this down to a level uh, where it's easy to grasp how revolutionary it actually is. Their primary division, remember, the primary social division within the Puritan society is the elect and the damned. Now, these people in the Puritan churches have a very distinct idea about who the elect might actually be. You can't ever tell who is and who isn't saved. You're never going to know until the exact moment that you get to heaven or don't get to heaven. So when, uh, and I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, we'll get to why they believe this in a couple of minutes, but generally speaking, they, dis they believed 
that people who worked hard and were successful by virtue of their hard work, these were the people who were most likely to be the elect. So they look at society and they say success and wealth suggest that a person is elect, but it's based on hard work. So for this reason alone, when they look at the nobility, when they look at the king, they do not believe that the king and the, and the nobility can possibly be members of the elect. Because are they wealthy? Yes, absolutely they are wealthy. But they are wealthy precisely because they get their wealth flowing upward from people who are average, everyday English citizens. So the king and the nobility do not work hard for that wealth, so they can't possibly be members of the elect. But here's another reason why this is revolutionary. And I'm going to, in the uh, in the lecture here, I'm going to give you a second to think about it, and pretty much just a second to think about it. But remember the Puritan problem with the hierarchy. Their hierarchy is God, and then the king who gets his right to rule from God. That's why he's God's representative on earth. So you've got God, then you've got the king, then you've got the archbishops, you've got the bishops, you've got the priesthood, and then you've got the people. Remember, the Puritans don't like all that hierarchy. They say all of this stuff gets in the way of God communicating with man. So as they see it, what we need to do is get rid of the hierarchy. Who's at the second position in that hierarchy? It's the king. Okay, so the king is a key part of that hierarchy. If he's not God's representative on earth, because the Puritans don't think God needs a representative on earth, man can communicate directly. If you don't need him to be God's representative on earth, you don't need the king, period. So the king should be out. Now, these people wind up at their most radical, calling for the overthrow of the, of the elite within England, getting rid of the, quote, nobility and getting rid of the aristocracy and replacing it with, as they put it, an aristocracy of the spirit. People in the Anglican, excuse me, people within the Puritan societies who could reasonably be assumed to be the elect. People who could reasonably be assumed to be the elect. And of course, the uh, the height of this uh, belief is that in 1649, after they seize power in England, the, uh, the when the Puritans seize power, one of the first things they do is they execute the King of England. So we know that they were, they not only were talking this way, they acted on this stuff as well. Now, to be clear, uh, just because they're talking about overthrowing the king and getting rid of the nobility, they do not favor democracy. They're not in favor of everybody being able to participate and everybody being equal in society. Because remember what I said, they want to get rid of the traditional aristocracy, that elite aristocracy within England, and they want to replace it with a, quote, aristocracy of the spirit. So it would be an aristocracy of the elect, not a democratic revolution uh, within uh, England. Now, the Puritans also had another belief that we haven't talked about yet, or another ideal, I suppose, not really a belief, an ideal uh, that they focused on. Uh, and this ideal uh, was the ideal of introspection, the idea of looking in, into oneself and trying to figure out who am I, what do I really believe, and how do I fit in with this hierarchy that our group has created, this idea of elect or damned. Uh, which one am I? Okay, That's the primary question that these people are going to be asking most of their lives, is which one am I? And introspection, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to help them kind of gain insight into whether you are elect or damned. So if we kind of want to, if we want to think about it in this way, another, uh, another um, legacy of the Puritans is the modern obsession with analysis and psychoanalysis, that people are constantly trying to figure out 
who they are and where they fit in and what they believe and, and does it make sense in the world. So this is another legacy that the Puritans passed down. Now, if we look at their ideas about introspection, we can see introspection all over uh, their society. Uh, the Puritans were among the first group that kept diaries on a large scale, meaning virtually everyone kept diaries. They were constantly exploring how they felt about certain things and just pouring those things down uh, onto, into, into paper and saying, where am I? How do I fit in? Think about if any of you kept a journal or have ever kept a journal or kept a diary and think about what goes into those things. All you're doing or what you're doing, I shouldn't say all you're doing because it's actually an important endeavor. What you're doing is trying to explore where you fit in and what you're doing in life. And if you think that there's nothing introspective or gr there's no growth in that, just think about what you believe at, say, 20 or 25 and then look back and say, well, this is what I believed at the age of 15. Uh, I, gosh, I've, ob I've obviously grown in wisdom and insight. That's the point. That's why you keep a diary. So you can go back and you can kind of track all of that sort of stuff. These people also wrote novels. Uh, these novels were what we call captivity uh, or were the took the form of what were called captivity narratives during this time. So some of them were actual uh, were actual nonfiction. The point of these was not to sell books and say, oh, this might be a neat story that people want to hear and will buy. The idea behind novels and captivity narratives was to function as an allegory, to get people to look at this and say, okay, this person had a very tough time and they came through it. And that, on the other end, they were able to maintain, uh, they, were main they were able to maintain their faith and believe that they were actually blessed by God. So there's an allegorical nature to all of this. These captivity narratives, the captivity uh, is like the uh, narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson suggests. Uh, these were stories about Puritan women who had been abducted by Native Americans and lived with them and went through all of this stuff and were ultimately uh brought back into Puritan society. And they had a very specific term for what happened when somebody would go into one of, when they'd be captured by Native Americans and brought back into Puritan society. Their specific term for this was that they were quote unquote redeemed and brought home. So there's a religious undertone to all of this too. They also wrote letters, love letters to one another. Um, and if you think again about love letters, what the idea behind a love letter, there's something exploratory about that. That's People are pouring their heart out to one another when they're writing love letters. Uh, so it does not, uh, it, it doesn't surprise historians or didn't surprise historians to find large amounts of love letters because this was a perfect way to engage in introspection. Uh, so they're doing all of this. And this is all happening during a moment where England is in complete and utter chaos. As this is happening, think about that revolution where I told you that they, uh, where they execute the king. That was 1649. Uh, the Puritans, their, uh, their uh, voyages to the New World didn't begin until the late 1630s. So this is all happening collectively. These people are looking at the world around them and trying to make sense of it. They're trying, they see chaos all around them, and they're trying to make sense of that chaos. So when they do it, they do things like they pass sumptuary laws, for example, uh, that dictate what types of consumer goods people could actually buy based on what uh, their place in the social order was. Uh, they dictated uh, at Harvard University, they said, we're going to rank our classes when they, when they uh, found Harvard. They say, we're going to rank our classes based on wealth, not by grades. So the person who was ranked number one, say in the Harvard class of 1655, that person was the wealthiest person in the class. Not the person who had the best academic record, but the wealthiest person in the class. At church, men separate, sat separated from women, and then people sat from front to back in the church, again, based on wealth. The closer you were, the wealthier you were. So there's obviously a sense of order being created here, but a sense of order connected to wealth. And I want you to hold on to that thought uh, for a few minutes here, this idea of the connection to actual wealth. Now, 
while they're doing this, strangely enough, they're why they're setting the seeds for their own destruction. Within a hundred years, the Puritan movement had gotten it, it just disappeared. It was gone. And these people who were calling themselves Puritans are replaced by a generation that is calling themselves quote unquote Yankees or Yankee capitalists, as we call them today. The goal of Yankee capitalists was to attain wealth. And these people are incredibly successful. Now, these, de these descendants of the Puritans, and some of them are actually, quote, former Puritans themselves, they live in a region in Massachusetts. They live in a region that has a very short growing season. They have cold weather. They have rocky soil, so it's not really suitable to agricultural pursuits, and yet these people wind up becoming incredibly wealthy. So how do they transform from Puritan, quote-unquote, to Yankee? The answer came from a 19th century psychologist uh, and philosopher named Max Weber. Max Weber uh, engaged in a sociological study to try to figure out what connection there is between religious belief and religious societies and their economies and how they deal with people. And what he did was he started first by simply just exam examining Catholicism in relation uh, to uh, Protestantism. And what he came up with was this idea that the Catholic religion, as he put it, so if any of you hear this stuff and you're going, you know, I don't believe in any of that sort of stuff, your beef is with Max Weber, not with me. Max Weber wrote that the Catholic religion was perfectly suited to, as he put it, an economically backward world. In Catholic societies, even the poorest people give charitable donations to the church. Plus, he said, you have a large population within society, in priests and nuns, who theoretically do not contribute to population growth. Throughout these Catholic societies, Weber argued, the bulk of money is not spent on business ventures. It's not spent on infrastructure, but rather what it's done, what it's spent on is the Catholic Church. It's built, it's spent on construction of churches. It's built, uh, or it's, it's spent on the construction of rectories. It's built on the, uh, uh, it's spent on the building of convents, on hospitals, on schools, on, uh, on orphanages, those sorts of things. But it's not spent on infrastructure that will help change the economic lives of the people who live in those societies. Now, Weber, as much as he said, quote, an economically backward world, he conceded that from an economic standpoint, Catholic societies are steady. OK, if you look, if you plotted their economy on a line or on a graph, it would be steady. But that's kind of the problem in economy. You don't want steadiness. What you want is growth, and there's n simply not growth in these Catholic societies uh, from Weber's perception. So, stable, but they don't grow. Protestantism, on the other hand, Weber concluded that Protestantism emphasizes growth from the word go. It emphasizes growth in the Holy Spirit. It emphasizes uh, the importance of the individual relationship with God. So Protestants have this built-in incentive to, quote, grow. And the Puritans, as he saw it, were the very best of the Protestants. They did all of this Protestant stuff better than anybody else. For example, Puritans came to a belief that wealth indicated that God was showering you with blessings. Thus, if you were wealthy, if you were in good health, if you're uh, if your wife gave birth to healthy children every single time out, then it must mean God is blessing you, and therefore you are probably, again, there's no way to know for sure, but you are probably a member of the elect because, after all, God would not shower blessings down on people that he's planning to send to hell. Now, the converse is true here as well. If a person is impoverished, if their crops don't grow, if they're constantly sick, uh, if, they have, uh, if they have no children over the course of their marriage, then it would suggest the opposite. It would suggest that God 
is not showering this person with blessings, and thus that person is probably not a member of the elect. So Puritanism emphasized growth in a way that no other group did. On top of that, uh, Puritanism emphasized individualism even more than most Protestant uh, groups did. Uh, most Protest uh, most Puritan churches, uh, again, believed in a distinct lack of hierarchy, so much so that they did not even allow their uh, their ministers to preach what's called dogma to them, saying and dogma is very simply, you can't do that because we believe it. Well, why do we believe it? Because we do. Okay, that's the very simple idea of dogma. So you can't do it because it's against our beliefs. And they said, that doesn't work. Not every group believes the same thing within the Puritan church. So if a, if a preacher does not fill the needs of the community anymore, that preacher doesn't get to stick around just because he's the priest that the diocese has sent in, and that's just the way it goes. Puritan churches had the ability to have a thumbs up or thumbs down vote on their ministers. And if they decided this minister doesn't work for us, he's out, then that's the way it goes. So Weber looks at all of this stuff and says, these are the ones who are suited for growth. And then he starts looking at them and says, oh my God, look at their growth, look at their income, look at the wealth explosion within Puritan societies. And he says, this is why, this is why it all happened. Now the Puritan societies were founded over the course of 11 separate voyages to the New World, to Massachusetts uh, and the surrounding region. Uh, however, and, and for what it's worth, they do not have the same problem that the settlers in Virginia had, where they're fighting Indians. Uh, they, they do fight Indians. I don't want to make it sound like they don't, but they're not fighting Indians over corn. They bring the Indians in. They allow, they, they learn from the Indians. They become farmers themselves. They become very hard workers themselves and grow crops and all of this stuff. So they have a different way of settling this area than the people in Virginia did. But something happens to the uh, Massachusetts Bay experiment in 1640. In 1640, the English Revolution be the begins uh, in uh, back home, and it culminates in the uh, the Puritans. Ultimately, they see they are the ones who are in charge. They they seize power. They establish a dictatorship in England, a temporary dictatorship. And now Puritans in New England are looking back home and going, people like us are now in charge here. This is gonna be this is gonna be great for us. But the Puritans back home had a different take on this. The Puritans back home told the people in New England that hey, you we can't help you right now. We can't send more supplies. We can't send more ships. We can't send more people because we've got things to handle here in England. They pointed out that, look, we're trying to hold on to power. There are royalists, people who want to bring the king back. There are people who are saying, we don't want the king, but we don't want you either, who are trying to fight for control. So the Puritans back home said, you guys are going to have to figure out how to make a living on your own. It's not going to be us supporting the colony. It's going to be you supporting yourself. So while they do have a lot of people who are farming and working very hard, they say, we've got to find a source of wealth. We've got to find an immense source of wealth if we are to survive. And as it turns out, they do find that source of wealth. The source of wealth was right there in the Atlantic. Turned out the North Atlantic was full of cod. And cod turned out, a type of fish, turned out to be their gold. They began catching this cod in larger and larger numbers. They began selling them to shippers who were coming up the coastline from uh, through that triangle trade. So as they came up the coastline, they would uh, not only sell enslaved peoples, they'd take on codfish so that they could feed themselves as they went back home to Europe. The Puritans also rationalized that they've got a ready-made market for cod back home in Europe. They know that there's lots of Catholics 
in Europe who do not eat meat on certain days. So cod will be perfect to fill in that gap. So for them, this allows them to make a ton of money. On top of that, they wind up taking the um, molasses and sugar that these sugar that these ships are full of and turning that molasses into rum, which winds up becoming an incredibly valuable commodity. They wind up becoming incredibly uh, good ship builders as a consequence of living in New England and having access to these vast forests. forests. Uh, they become uh, involved in virtually every maritime trade, everything that's associated with seagoing trade they're involved in it, and they are making tons of money. They are making – virtually everyone is making money. And this causes a problem within Puritan society. While it's great and it, quote, saves them and makes sure that they don't suffer any potential fate like having the plug pulled on the experiment, they also wind up having the basis right there for destroying their, their society. It has a negative effect. Their social hierarchy breaks down because of people entering the middle class. You have all of these poor people, for example, who were poor farmers in the era before all of the seagoing trade. Well, now, all of a sudden, these people who are these poor farmers, if they turn to seagoing trade, if they come in and say, well, I'm a terrible farmer, but, you know, back home in England, I was a carpenter, and maybe I can apply my skills in the shipmaking trade, well... Turns out they're right. They can go in and apply that to the ship-making trade. They start making money, and they start becoming successful, and they move into the middle class. Well, remember these people's belief was if you are, you know, first of all, God decides who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, and there's nothing you can do to change it. If you're poor, it probably means that God has consigned you to hell. But now, all of a sudden, you seem to be getting showered with blessings. So which one is it? Is it God showering you with blessings? Or is it something that is a mistake? Is it something that is just, you know, this person is becoming wealthy, but it doesn't mean anything. And if this person's wealth doesn't mean anything, then maybe that wealthy person's wealth doesn't mean anything. So everybody starts questioning this basic idea of whether predestination actually works or not not, whether it works or not. So entry went into the capitalist marketplace, turns the Puritans into these so-called Yankee capitalists, but it also messes everything up for them as well. Now the next crisis for them is basic, uh, basic the basic religious beliefs within uh, the Puritan society. Uh, remember, their, their base philosophy is predestination. Under this under this idea of predestination, uh, it, it should be obvious to you. If it's not, I'm going to tell you right now. Predestination condemns the vast majority of society. That's just a given. It's not a reward if everybody gets it. So not everybody is going to heaven. So predestination, if God's saying some people are going to heaven, some people are going to hell, it's only going to be a select few. That's why they're calling themselves the elect, okay? So there's a very small group that are going to heaven. And people look at this and go, well, maybe this doesn't make sense. We certainly can't figure it out on the basis of wealth. But they also start thinking about other potential flaws in all of this stuff. It's kind of hard for us to imagine today the idea of holding a newborn baby in your hand the way – in your hands the way Puritans would and say, well – and think through it logically and go, well – there's a better than even chance that this little kid is going to be going to hell. That's not something people really like to think. That's something that's unthinkable in the modern era, but these people are doing it. In fact, they literally don't even name their children until they – they don't permanently name their children until they start reaching four or five years of age, and they know for a fact that that child is going to, to live a reasonably – uh, long life within society. So they start looking at that sort of stuff and say, well, the vast majority are condemned to hell. And even these babies are condemned to hell. And they go, that just doesn't make sense. We, we don't like this idea. Uh, and so few people are clear on what 
elect being elect actually means that they start questioning well all these people who we've said are elect how do we know for sure that they're elect so what they start doing is they start making everybody prove that they've had a conversion experience basically these people are going to have to stand up in front of the church they're going to have to give their testimony and talk about how here are the ways God has blessed me and here are the things I've accomplished in my life and this is the type of introspection I've in, I've gone through and I believe I am I'm sure of it I am elect and then the congregation the group of pe- the uh the people within the church have a thumbs up or thumbs down vote and say yes we believe this person is elect or no, we don't believe this person is elect. They also said only people who have had this conversion experience can actually be church members. So there's a whole problem with the idea of predestination, with wealth determining who's uh, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, determining who is the actual elect. It just destroys Puritan society on some level. But before it can really destroy Puritan society, uh, an event happens that actually does destroy Puritan society. And it's probably the thing that most of us think about when we think about the Puritans, and that is the Salem witch trials. The Salem witch trials began in the home of a man named Samuel Paris in 1692. Uh, In in this particular circumstance, uh, a group of adolescent girls, eight adolescent girls, Uh, conducted a ritual to try to see the future, uh, to see what their lives were going to be like. Uh, When one of the girls claimed in this ritual that they were carrying out that she saw a coffin, she started to shriek. And then pretty shortly after that, all of the other girls were swearing that, yes, I saw the same thing. And uh, they also started shrieking and screaming. And they started acting strangely. And finally, when they were settled down, they started. Uh, they started claiming that they had been possessed of, by ghosts. That there were witches or ghosts or something that was causing them to act strangely. Now the girls had actually been assisted in this ritual by a slave of Samuel Paris named Tichaba. Tichaba had been enslaved in the West Indies, and she wound up coming to uh, coming to into Samuel uh, Paris's ownership. And one of the things she thought she could do was uh, uh, was help the girls uh, not only figure out the future, but she could determine whether they were actually possessed by creating something called a witch's cake. And if you want to know what a witch's cake is, it, there's actually a fairly it's a fairly gross thing. Uh, so your your homework tonight uh, or today is to go and Google a witch's cake. Uh, and Samuel Paris found out about all of this. And when Paris found out that she was helping them in these rituals to try to figure out their future, to try to divine the future, and that they were doing things like creating a witch's cake, and with the girls cl- screaming and claiming they had been possessed, Paris begins questioning Tichaba as well as the girls themselves about what exactly happened here. Uh, now, he brings in doctors And these doctors look at the girls, they examine the girls, and conclude that the girls are possessed, that there are clearly evil spirits that are possessing these girls. And there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they, as medical doctors, can actually do about this. So armed with this information, Samuel Paris turns all of this essentially over uh, to religious authorities. And the religious authority uh, within within, uh, Salem, Massachusetts, uh, essentially questions all of these people. With Tichaba, it's a little bit different. Tichaba's a slave. So they actually quite literally torture Tichaba uh, into admitting various things. But ultimately, the girls admit th- that they were doing these rituals, that they were doing them with the help of Tichaba, and that they were possessed by quote-unquote witches. So the information is taken to Tichaba, and Tichaba admits finally after massive amounts of torture, that she is, in fact, one of the witches. She's a witch, and she has been doing all of this stuff to these girls. Now, when she's tortured, Tichaba also names several other people. She names uh, uh, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, who just happen to be two elderly, unpopular women 
within uh, within Salem society. So uh, I'm sorry, the girls named Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, uh, while Tichaba named four women and one man as witches. Now, the trials begin here at this particular moment, going out and finding these four women, the one man, and arresting Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne on, quote, suspicion of being a witch and practicing these sort of uh, these sort of dark secrets, if you will. Um, and the trials were very odd. They are not like modern trials. The trials were peculiar in that if a person pled guilty and they named names, they were set free. So if a person said, you got me, I'm a witch, and they named names, they said, and by the way, those four people over there, they're also witches. That was it. That person got to walk away completely free. If you pled guilty but refused to name names, you were executed. You were sentenced to execution by hanging. If a person pled not guilty, they were sentenced to execution by hanging. And there was also a very odd evidentiary uh, uh, status here, and it was called spectral evidence. A person could claim that they were being haunted by someone. So a person could say, I am being haunted by the ghost of Jose Lima. And that would be enough for the police or the, the, the religious authorities here to go out and arrest Jose Lima. That's it. There's no evidence. There's nothing other than an accusation. Now, today in the modern world, if an accusation is made, the police go out or theoretically the police go out and they gather evidence and then they go out and charge these people. But this is totally different. It's the spectral evidence. If you claim you're being haunted by somebody, that's enough for the authorities to go out and, and drag this person into court. And again, if they admit they're, they're a witch and say, yeah, here's more witches, they can go. But if they don't, they're executed. So an accusation was enough in many cases to get people uh, executed. And the uh, accusations came fast. They came very quickly throughout all of this. Approximately 150 people are going to be placed in jail as, under suspicion of being witches. Many of these 150 actually died uh, while they were waiting trial. Uh, 19 in all were convicted and executed of witchcraft. There was a 20th man who was convicted, quote unquote, because he simply refused to accept the authority of the courts, and he wound up being pressed to death. And the way pressing uh, works is a person is placed between two boards, and we'll use my pencils as the boards, placed between two boards, and then ever-increasing amounts of rocks are placed on top of the top board so that ultimately what happens is that it presses that person, it crushes them, uh, and they become, uh, they die as a consequence of it. So 20 people are actually executed uh, as a consequence uh, of all of these trials. Now, many of the 150 were elderly, unpopular women, which has led uh, at least one historian to say uh, that if you look at these people, this was a, uh, a distinct challenge to, uh, to generational authority, which we'll talk about here uh, in a couple of seconds. Uh, all of this, though, it's, it's weird. This, tr this series of trials came to a screeching halt when the wife of the governor of Massachusetts was ch accused of being a witch. At that point, the governor of Massachusetts stepped in and said, that's enough. We're stopping all of this nonsense. Now, memories of this stuff actually die very hard. People don't forget these things easily. And uh, in the 1950s, we see, a we see a memory of this manifested in a play called The Crucible by Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller saw similarities between the trials, the uh, or the hearings, excuse me, of the House and American Activities Committee to try to root out communism in Hollywood. He saw similarities between those hearings and what was happening in the Salem witch trials. Now, the big thing that he noted in all of this, the big similarity he noted, was the, pu the accusation and punishment part of it. In the 1950s, just like uh, with the Salem witch trials, if somebody was accused of being a communist, it wasn't uh, innocent until proven guilty. 
that person would have to come to the House on American Activities Committee and prove to them that they were not a communist. And then if they could not demonstrate that they were not a communist, they were blacklisted. They were essentially, uh, they would essentially suffer a career execution. So Miller saw a distinct parallel here and wrote the play The Crucible, which on the surface is about the Salem witch trials, but is in actuality an allegory about these communist uh, hearings before the House on American Activities Committee. Uh, and, and again, the same things applied in terms of evidence that uh, that if you refuse to name names, then you got blacklisted. If you uh, if you said, yeah, I'm a communist, and here are the names of five other communists, people were freed. They were let go uh, from their response. So it's a very odd circumstance. Now, the, nobody's really sure what caused the Salem witch trials. But what we do know is that witch hunts crop up in virtually every generation, including the current generation. And the goal of these witch hunts is always, it's always about getting rid of the people who are doing something bad before they actually subvert and destroy society. So given that context, how can we explain the Salem witch trials? Well, one simple explanation is this. The Puritans, like many people in the 17th century, believed in actual, literal witchcraft and believe, believed in the literal existence of a devil. What happened in Salem was not uh, unusual for the time. In places like Germany, for example, 900 suspected witches were, were killed uh, by various local authorities. In Alsace-Lorraine, which happened to be under the control of France at that time, 2,000 suspected witches were burned at the stake. So if there's anything unique, quote-unquote, about Salem, it's the relatively small number uh, who died at Salem. But in terms of the belief in witches and how you deal with this problem, it's a very common circumstance of the era. A second way we can explain this is, the so is what I would call the flight of fancy of young girls. These girls led an incredibly repressive life. They had very little freedom. It does not seem co uh, to be a coincidence that it was young girls who were involved in the accusations and it was older women who were constantly being accused. It was a sort of vicarious lashing out at that generation. They couldn't, these girls could not lash out directly at their parents' generation but they could lash out at the gener at that actual generation in other ways and vicariously punish their parents. Uh, so it's a distinct way of lashing out. But there's also another explanation. There were deeper problems within Puritan society. Obviously, for reasons we've already talked about, society seemed to be breaking down because of the breakdown of religious idealism and the uh, breakdown of uh, of predestination. But there's also some other things here. The English are involved in a war with France during this period, and New England winds up obviously getting dragged into it. And New Englanders did not like being dragged into this war. The French in places like Nova Scotia uh, were among the best trading partners New Englanders had. So what they frequently did was they subverted English rules uh, about not trading with the French. And it got really ugly, and the war dragged out for, for much longer than everybody expected. Hundreds of men wound up being killed. Uh, and this meant, especially in a society where women don't have any rights and are repressed, it meant that there were fewer men coming home who could be husbands, who could create a life for these women. Uh, the war was also an economic disaster uh, in that New England ran out of gold and silver, and they began printing paper currency, uh, banknotes that were not backed by anything, by a measurable commodity. Uh, this caused a tremendous amount of inflation within Puritan society, uh, and it, it, things got very ugly uh, in all of this. Now, once the war with the, uh, the French ended uh, in this period, the Puritans almost immediately got into another war, this time with Native Americans, called King Philip's War. And in King Philip's War, uh, the, the leader of these Indians in Massachusetts was essentially trying to come up with this massive Indian confederation with the purpose of wiping out these New Englanders, to force them to get on boats and go back home to England. Now, he was very successful. King Philip, uh, a Narragansett leader, was very successful in, 
in defeating uh, English soldiers uh, and New England soldiers uh, primarily uh, to the point that New Englanders were legitimately worried about, well, is the colonial experiment going to end because of this? Uh, the way the war with King Philip actually ends is literally a matter of dumb luck. The Puritan military leadership wound up stumbling into a village that just happened to house all of the leaders of this Indian confederation. They'd gotten together for this big meeting. The Puritans stumbled onto it and burned it to the ground, and they literally just got lucky and defeated the Indians by burning this village to the ground. Now, witchcraft episodes happen when societies are breaking down, when societies are in flux, and people need to find a scapegoat. So this all helps explain the whole problem of the Puritan, or excuse me, of the Salem witch trials. But it also helped destroy Puritanism because it ate into people's consciences. People who were involved in the Salem witch trials, like the judges, for example, got to a point where they said, you know, yeah, we were wrong. We should not have done that. The judges ultimately confessed uh, publicly. They, they weren't forced to, they weren't put on trial or anything. But when asked in retrospect, was this wrong, what you did? They all, con they all confessed where, their guilt. They said, no, nah, you know, I can't live with myself over this sort of stuff. The colony, the colonial government, ultimately came to the conclusion that we have to compensate the people, the families of these people that we executed. We've got to compensate the people who died in jails waiting for their trials. So this ate away into the entire conscience of the colony. Uh, and Puritans were looked at as increasingly out of step uh, and irrational, uh, and Puritanism just kind of died out. It withered away. Now, New England's economy begins to recover almost concurrently with the decline of Puritanism. Now, it's more a matter of that decline of Puritanism happens coincidentally with the end of these wars and all of that stuff. So an economic recovery was inevitable. But people look at this. People like to look at things in very simplistic ways. So they start looking at it and going, we got rid of the Puritans and everything started getting better. So obviously the Puritans were bad for us. So they're recovering from an economic perspective, but they also look at what's going on in their society and they say, yeah, but things aren't better. They look at themselves and say, we aren't happier with our lives. They said, we're starting to become too materialistic and that our sense of community is breaking down. And they start looking at it and going, you know, one thing about the Puritans is there was always a distinct sense of community. And if they were being honest about this stuff. They were thinking in terms of how do we get the stuff that the Puritans were doing that we think is good, and how do we maintain the economic prosperity? How can we get some of this back? Uh, how do we become less obsessed with materialism? Well, the answer actually came from Europe. There was a movement of religious awakening going on that became known as, quote, the Great Awakening. It starts in, in Europe, but it ultimately takes root in the Americas, in New England. Uh, and ministers like Jonathan Edwards began preaching sermons to these New Englanders about their entire obsession with materialism and telling them, you need to undergo a spiritual revival or all of this is going to fade away. And he argued that if everybody does this, every element of society will be successful. So it takes hold first in New England, but then it ultimately spreads throughout all of the colonies. It winds up going throughout all of England's North American colonies like wildfire. So it winds up being a great shared experience. Now I want you to listen uh, to Jonathan, a portion of Jonathan Edwards' most famous sermon. It's something called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I want you to hear just precisely what these people are hearing and I want us to take away the right things from this sermon. What he says in this sermon is the following, quote, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you. Let me break that down. God hates you. God does not like you. So God abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else 
but to be cast into the fire. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell last night when you went to sleep. Now, think about the undercurrents here. He's affirming that God does not like these people, that he's ready to cast them into hell. In fact, he's saying that's what they deserve. God is dreadfully provoked, and you have offended him, and you deserve to go to hell. But he's also throwing something very important in there. God's holding them over the fire and deciding, I should drop these people. But instead of just going like that, instead of doing that, he's also going, maybe I shouldn't throw them in. I'm going to drop them. No, I'm not going to drop them. So the undercurrent here, the impl implication here, is that unlike with predestination, where God's already decided this and there's nothing to think about, God's angry and he's making the decision right now. And because he's making the decision and going, eh, should I do it? Should I let him go? No, I'm not going to do it. It implies that God's mind can be changed. It's not predestined. So the evolution here, if you will, is that we've gone from predestination during the Puritan era to the Great Awakening where the individual can actually change God's mind. And that is a key part of the philosophy of the Great Awakening, that the individual is important. In fact, the individual is the most important part of all of this. God does not work through leaders. God does not work through institutions like the church. God works through the individual. But also, remember here, I told you that this is a shared experience. It starts out in New England and it spreads as far south as South Carolina. Everybody is engaging in this great awakening. So it becomes a shared American experience. All of these people are starting to think in terms now. They're thinking in terms of, we have something in common. And it's not that we all came across this ocean and started settling and colonizing and all of this stuff. What we have in common is this shared identity about our religious thought. It also helps create religious denominationalism because while they do have this sort of common ideology and common American identity, they don't all intend to be Anglicans. So there are Anglican churches that are preaching this, this new message. There are Methodist churches and Baptist preachers and some a handful of Catholic preachers that are doing this, such that we have an explosion of religious denominationalism and sectarianism within what's about to become the United States in the next 50 years. So it helps create a very diverse religious population, something that's, to be fair, if we looked at it in comparison to the modern U.S., it's not terribly religiously diverse. But compared to the rest of the world of the 1690s and the early 1700s, this is incredibly diverse from a religious standpoint. So if we take all of this, this sectarianism, people splitting off into different sections of belief and different sections of, uh, of ideology, uh, but we've got a shared experience that created those ideologies, something that allows them to be thinking in terms of rather than saying, I'm a New Yorker or I'm a Virginian, they can go, I'm an American. And this individualistic notion that they are the important thing, that the people are the important thing, not the institutions, not the leaders. It's a critically important moment from a psychological perspective. The American Revolution does not happen without the Great Awakening. These things are all key parts of the American identity and the American philosophy that rejects British authority. And that's something that we will talk about in the next, the next lecture. So join me again when we reconvene for Lecture 6 about the coming of the American Revolution.